Hey guys, um, you know, we're about to watch an interview with Dr. Mark Strauss. Dr. Mark Strauss is a beast. He is a New Testament scholar. Um, he is an expert in the Gospels, but he is also a Bible translator. He's served on the committee for the New International Version uh, Study Bible. Uh, he's written lots of books and scholarly articles. One of the books I reference in um, this interview is one called uh, Four Portraits, One Jesus, and it's how the four Gospels tell the story of Jesus and paint a whole picture of Jesus. And um, he just gives some brilliant insight into Jesus, the New Testament, the study of the Bible. And he's a crazy smart scholar, but he does it in a way that like everyone can understand. And um, in this interview, you're also gonna find an old friend of Clovis Hills, uh, Pastor John Annan. Uh, if you don't know who John Annan is, John was our uh, youth pastor for about 13 years at the North Campus here. He was the children's pastor. He ended up being a campus pastor at our Old Town Campus, and he's gone on to bigger and better things. He's a senior pastor now in Nebraska. And uh, we did this interview together, and it was a lot of fun getting to catch up uh, with Dr. Mark Strauss. You'll find him in all kinds of things. Lee Strobel wrote about him in The Case for Christ, and he's uh, appeared in God's Not Dead, and he's just done so many things, and he's this heavyweight scholar that just really can bring hard things to all of us that we can understand. So I hope you enjoy this interview. All right, uh, so uh, Mark, our first question for you today is inquiring minds want to know uh, how uh, Pastor Dr. Sean was as a student, because he was actually a student in your class. So how was he as a Greek student? Well, I can honestly say he was a model student. <laughs> he loved to learn. And any, t any student that loves to learn is, is just a joy to have in class. And so I knew that Sean was going to go far from the moment I got to know him because from the time I got to know him because he, he loved to learn. He had a humble spirit and, and just, just wanted to be there. You know, he wasn't there to get the credentials. He was, he was there because this information was really important to him. So great. Very, student. Cool. Very cool. Is that how you recall it, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love seminary. I, I, I miss it, to be honest. I miss learning and just diving into things like that and being able to ask guys that are way smarter than me questions. And uh, it was a really fun environment for me, to be honest. Very yeah. cool. Well, hey, uh, one of the areas that, that Mark is, is an expert in is translation. So Sean, why don't you get us started in the translation area? You know, uh, Mark, you, uh, there's something that has rung in my mind ever, you know, for however long it's been. I think I graduated in 2006. I was probably taking your classes in the early 2000s. And um, you always say every translation, because we have hundreds of Bible translations in English. Every translation is an interpretation. Could you really explain what you mean by that? Because I, I think that's, that's a sure. fascinating concept. Most people probably have never grasped. Yeah, and some some people will say I don't want to I don't want a commentary. I just want a translation. Just tell me what the Greek and Hebrew means. Uh, but but the challenge we face is that every time you translate a single word from the Hebrew or Greek into English, you're already doing interpretation because no two words line up. No word in Greek lines up exactly with the word in English. Every word in Greek has a range of potential meanings. You have to decide what it means in that context and then find an appropriate word in the English context that would represent that same meaning. So every single word you translate is an act of interpretation. Mm. And then you add on that the fact that no two languages are the same in terms of idioms, in terms of grammar, in terms of the way meaning is presented and it becomes even, even more complicated. The example I love to use because I live in Southern California is the Spanish phrase como se llama. Como se llama, if you said, what does that mean? Well, a literal translation would be how yourself call, how yourself call. But that's a terrible translation of como se llama. Como se llama means what's your name. Mm -hmm. What you've done is you've totally rearranged the words. You've rearranged the grammar. You've taken what in Spanish is a question word, como, a reflexive pronoun, say, a, a, a verb, llama, and you've turned it into a totally different construction. In English, we use a question word, what, the verb to be is, a possessive pronoun, your, and a noun name. You've changed the grammar completely, but you preserved 
the meaning, and that's the key. So translation is about preserving meaning, and to do that, you've got to first interpret what the meaning in the Greek and Hebrew is, and then find equivalents, phrases, idioms, words that communicate the same meaning in English. So there is no interpretation. There is no translation without interpretation. That's really good. Um, you know, sometimes people will talk about I want the literal or a word for word versus something that might be more paraphrased or um, in, in your field, uh, a dynamic equivalent, right? It's kind of down the middle. Could you maybe explain like how those three work and, and the different philosophies behind those types of translations? Yeah, there, there really is a misunderstanding. Um, you'll sometimes hear someone say, I want, to, I, I want this to be literally accurate or, but, but that's actually an oxymoron when it comes to translation. To be literal is not to be accurate for the most part because no two languages line up exactly. So everyone knows this who learns a second language. You try to just replace words in a formal manner. Sometimes literal translation is called formal equivalence. You try to just replace words, it's gonna be gibberish. It's gonna be nonsense. None of our translations, our English translations are even close to literal. The New, Amer the New American Standard Bible, which is probably the most formally equivalent of easily available translations is nothing like literal. You can't possibly line up word for word. They are moving words around until they get to the point where it's just comprehensible. But does that mean it's a good translation because it's comprehensible? You want sure. something to sound as clear and accurate to the meaning of the text in English, the receptor language, as you did in the original language, in the donor language, which is Greek or Hebrew. So literal is, is really the wrong thing to strive for in translation. The goal of translation should be to accurately represent the meaning of the text. And so the idea of paraphrase, paraphrase means to say the same thing in other words. Well, all translation says the same thing in other words, because you're taking all Greek or Hebrew words and turning them into English words. So, so this idea that paraphrase is bad, well, Linguists use the word paraphrase differently. Linguists use the word paraphrase to refer to rephrasing something in the same language, in the same language. So in other words, if you said something highly technical and I summarized it really briefly and clearly, that would be a paraphrase. But when you're moving across languages, it's all about translation, not paraphrase. So I would not even use the word paraphrase. I'd, I'd use either literal or formal equivalent and functional equivalent or meaning-based translation. All good translation is going to be functionally equivalent. It's gonna communicate the meaning using different words because all the words are different. No, that's great, that's great. Do you, is there a, I know you um, were involved with the NIV translation. You're on a board, were you on the committee to translate? Could you that's explain kind of your experience with the NIV? Sure. Yeah, sure. For the last 15 years, I've been on the, <coughs> excuse me, I've been on the Committee on Bible Translation, which is the 15 member uh, committee that maintains the new international version. Mm -hmm. And it has maintained it ever since the 1960s, actually, that translation was produced, it was published in 78, but it was, it was produced starting in the 1960s. And there were over 100 translators of the NIV, but there was a standing committee of 15 half Old Testament, approximately half New Testament scholars who maintain the text. They're absolutely independent. They come from different English speaking countries like Great Britain, like India, like Australia, New Zealand. Um, we have an Anglophone African. Um, so so they're, they're different English, which is what it makes the new international version international, um, but it's meant to represent multiple denominations um, and that committee is self-sustaining in the sense that, that we examine and bring in new members. Um, the NIV is sponsored by an organization called Biblica, which is the International Bible Society, it's formerly the International Bible Society. They own the copyright, so they sponsor us financially, but we produce the translation independently of, of any denominational pressure, any publishing pressure. We meet for a week pretty much every year. We receive proposals, examine those proposals, um, de debate those proposals, and then vote on them for changes uh, that 
no translation is ever finished because English is constantly changing. And so mm -hmm. it takes a 70% vote of the committee. Our motto is if it's not broke, don't fix it. So you need a very high standard in order to get a change. Every year we introduce changes, but those don't go in the actual text until a new edition comes out. And so the 2011 NIV was the last new edition. Um, we're looking at probably in the next five years or so, another new edition, but it'll be minor tweaks. You won't, most people won't even notice it. Um, but every year there's actually an NIV text that is now already, already changed. But until a new edition comes out, that won't actually be published and disseminated, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. John, you, you have some questions, man? Yeah. I'm uh, just thinking as, as you're talking, um, our, our, our folks in our congregation may just say, okay, just, just break it down for me. What's, what's the best one? Uh, is, is there a best one? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and talk about the, the why for that answer, which one yeah. you would, would yeah. lean on. Well, I jokingly say, of course, the best one is the NIV, you know, but, but of course I'm biased and I am biased, but that's not what I tell my students. Actually, I say you should always use more than one translation because additional translations give you a, another look at the text from a different angle. And that's really helpful. And we have a wealth, as, as you said, a wealth of good English translations. I would also say to use different translations from what we call across the translation spectrum. Um, idiomatic translations that are very natural English, like the New Living Translation, for example, or the New Century Version, excellent translations, by the way. They're committee works done by the best of scholars, but they're very natural English. They're the way we would say it. Then there's more formal or literal translations, like the New American Standard Bible, like the New Revised Standard Version, like the English Standard Version. Those seek to replicate or sort of reproduce the form of the original. I would argue those aren't as accurate, but they are really helpful because they give you a window on the Greek or the Hebrew. Then there's a whole body of translations in between those two. I call them mediating translations, but between the functional equivalent and the formal equivalent between the idiomatic and the more literal. And those are versions like the New International Version, the, the Christian Standard Bible, a recent um, uh, Baptist trend, Southern Baptist trend. Southern Baptist, that's our people. <laughs> right, and that's the great, that's a great version. We can talk about that a little bit as well. The, the Net Bible, the, uh, the, the New English translation. Um, those are all excellent middle of the road translations. Probably those middle of the road are the best sort of standard Bibles for the church because they have a nice balance. They're idiomatic, they're readable, they're, they're clear. And yet they really capture things like word plays and metaphors, mm. things you might lose in a, in a translation that's too idiomatic, that's too simple, if you will. So I would say for the church's Bible, sort of the, the publicly read one, something like the NIV or the CSB, is going to be your best option. Mm, that's good. Very cool. I actually recall uh, watching a video um, in one of our classes with uh, I believe Janine Brown, and uh, you, you would you and her, uh, her were talking. I believe it was her, the other person. I was. Yep. I, I recall you were the one that was saying a lot of the things on this video, and you said, um, "Yeah, if 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 you had a word for word or a thought for thought, uh, the choice, which way would you go?" You said thought for thought, and that surprised me because I just. For some reason in my upbringing, I thought, you know, word for word, ESV is the way to go. And uh, you said, no, whatever captures the meaning and gets it to you is the most important thing. Let me, let me illustrate that. If you went into the United Nations today, right, and the United Nations is a place where there's a speaker up front and simultaneously what they're speaking is going to be translated into a hundred different languages. I can guarantee you that not one of those interpreters would be translating it literally. And if they were, they'd be fired on the spot because it would be an <laughs> yeah. awful translation. That's real life translation. How come we think that when we go into the Greek and Hebrew, it's going to be any different? It's, it's the same. The best translation is idiomatic because you're saying, what does this mean? What do the original hearers hear? And how do I best communicate that in English? Uh, not in Biblish, you know, we sometimes talk about, you know, using Biblish sort of biblical idiom or Greeklish, that's even better, right? Um, but that's not the way translation works in any, anywhere in the real world. So why would we think that it would work that way um, in English and Greek and Hebrew? Yeah, that was, that was a really interesting. We had a colleague of yours, Bill Mounts, 
in an interview we did recently. And um, he, he has both worked with the NIV and the ESV. And he yeah. had a similar view as yours is he would rather have a more um, thought for thought approach. And um, we, that, that's a, a common fallacy we find on the internet all the time among Christians. Everywhere. It's pervasive. And the problem is, here's the problem is a little Greek is a dangerous thing, we sometimes say, right? So you, you learn a little Greek and you go, aha, this translation replicates the Greek. You know, it, you're looking at an interlinear and you go, wow, that is accurate. And then if you try to read it, you realize it's nonsense or it, you know, it's awkward or, it, you know, we don't understand it the way it was intended to be understood. But if a little Greek enables you to see that if you if you line it up, you think it's, it's going to be accurate. But that's not just not the way translation works. Yeah. Well, even if you read an interlinear, you have to interpret it. Oh, yeah. Exactly. You start reading the English like that. It, exactly. You have to interpret it or it makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. So, no, that's excellent. Um, hey, you uh, recently put out a, a, a book really more a textbook than just like a regular reader reader's book, but um, it is a good read. I've kind of been plowing through it and it's four portraits, one Jesus. And I think that that is um, really a, a fascinating subject for the church because time and time again, when I get someone who fa- starts to fall in love with the Bible, they, they start reading through the gospels and they start noticing like some of the, the, the gospel stories, like they don't match up sometimes. Right. You know, like sometimes, you know, um, in, in Mark, the centurion at the very end of end of the gospels, he, he looks up at Jesus and he says, surely this is the son of God. Right. But in Luke, he says, surely this is a righteous man. Mm-hmm. So you see these different kind of kind of stories going. And the first thought is that, well, the Bible's a textbook, so they have to line up perfectly. But you do a great job in this, kind of explaining how these four Gospels paint a picture of one person. Could you talk a little bit about this book and, and what brought you to write it? And sure, what about? sure. Yeah, and actually, it's it was published in 2007, the first edition. What is just ah. uh, is actually a second a second edition of, it's called, I'll grab it back here. It's called Four Portraits, One Jesus. I stumbled uh, across it la- th- this last year. That's why I right. thought it was new. No, but that's great. I'm glad you stumbled across it. Yeah. And, and basically that title does probably, even though it's like a 600 page textbook with charts and graphs, that title does summarize sort of my central thesis. And it's not new. Nothing's new to me. I didn't make up any of this stuff. But the, you have to ask the question, why did God give us four gospels instead of one? Well, to give us four unique portraits of who Jesus is. Probably historically, they were written in four different communities meant to address the needs and concerns of those communities. And so we can apply them in different contexts, different communities today, but it gives us a multifaceted portrait of who Jesus is. Um, it's, it's really interesting because um, we have a tendency to harmonize the four gospels. And that tendency probably occurs most in conservative evangelical contexts. When I first started teaching, I started teaching in a small conservative Christian college and they didn't have a class on the gospels. They had a class on the life of Christ. And basically the way that was taught in the past was they would take the four gospels and they take all the stories of the gospels and bring them together to try to get a chronology of Jesus's life. Um, you can get that by purchasing a harmony of the gospels that takes the four gospels and brings them together into one story. Now, the motives for that are pure. The motives is we want to know what actually happened. So we want to get the historicity right. But think about what you're doing when you're taking God's word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, inspired in four unique portraits of Jesus. Matthew was inspired. Mark was inspired. Luke was inspired. John was inspired. They gave us masterpieces. And what we do is we cut and paste them, create a whole new story, and then teach that instead of the spirit-inspired message of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I would say from the a theological perspective, we should not be harmonizing the Gospels. We should be listening to the voice of each of the individual Gospels. That's truth theologically. It's also true from a narrative perspective. These are literary masterpieces. We're going to miss so much if we cut and paste them together into one story. Mm -hmm. Uh, Harmony is good when you're trying to do apologetics, when you're trying to defend that these two stories, like the, the two stories you just mentioned, the way it's presented at the cross, the centurion's words. When you're trying to harmonize and find out 
how do these two fit together? That's fine to understand how, you know, what actually happened. But in terms of actually study, in terms of preaching the word, in terms of sharing it with others, we really need to listen to what the Holy Spirit gave us, which is four unique portraits. So that's why the title of the book is Four Portraits, One Jesus, and a strong emphasis that we should not be harmonizing. We should be reading, each in, reading preaching, and teaching each individual gospel as it was given to us. Now, I'm wondering, I've been using this analogy for years. I don't know if I got it from you. Um, you, you were in the book, The Case for Christ, right? Did not the book, but the video. The video, yeah. okay. The book was written a little before I was, uh, I had established myself as a, as a gospel scholar. But um, yeah, Lee Strobel did use me in the video, Case for Christ, yeah. Yeah, and so the analogy I believe I've heard, and I, I think I got it from you, I don't know. But, you know, if I'm watching, uh, if you have a, an accident that happens in an intersection and you have four different people on four different corners watching the same accident, they're all going to tell the same story, not exactly how, right? And the very fact that, that, that they don't harmonize shows that they weren't in cahoots together to make the story up. If anything, yeah. it actually verifies the, the historicity of the, of the Gospels as well. Is that, was that, did I steal that from you? Well, yeah, I, I don't think I started that by any means, but that's, that's certainly the case that, that we, by getting multiple perspectives by the fact that they're not trying to make sure everything aligns perfectly shows that there's no, you know, coercion going, going on here, no complicity going on there. Yeah. Sure. That as, as uh, you know, Luke is, is interviewing the apostles and he's one of them is remembering the story. They may not, they may not remember the centurion saying, Oh, surely this is a righteous or surely this is the son of God right they remember oh this is a righteous man right but then mark in his research one of the other apostles remembers like oh yeah surely this is the son of god the the truth is they could have said both right sure 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 and I, we don't you know, know, I, harmonize I do, it either that, that, that's right and i do want to put a proviso one little proviso on that is most scholars believe that mark's gospel was written first and that matthew and luke both used mark as a source Sure. So, so the fact, and, and I, I think that's absolutely true that they used Mark as a source. Then they brought together other things. So much of the the agreement we see is definitely related to the fact that they're using each other as they, they are using each other as sources. But then they're also free to, you know, to to gi give sort of a paraphrase of what Jesus said, or or to explain it or interpret it. One thing we have to realize. And, and must remember is that the gospel writers are themselves inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so what Matthew writes is inspired. It's the message of God to us through Matthew. So when he presents something that Jesus said, it may be a little different than Luke, but it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So his message is true. Now there's a, it's, it's a difficult challenge as to how close to the words of Jesus the words of the gospels are. Um, well, that's a whole nother language issue, right? Jesus probably it, was it, speaking it, it, in Aramaic it, 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 and Hebrew, and, and Greek. Right, right. And sometimes we, they use the Latin word phrase, um, is this the ipsissima verba or is this the ipsissima vox? Verba means words, vox means voice. So is this the actual words of Jesus that we always get or are we getting the authentic message or voice of Jesus? And in one sense, it can't be the exact words, because for the most part, Jesus was speaking Aramaic. And these are Greek translations, right? The, the, the Gospels are written in, in Greek. But the message comes through. And that if we allow that kind of freedom um, with, with the Gospel writers, then I think we're going to be a little less sort of obsessed that they don't say exactly the same words. The same significance or the same meaning is brought out in a different way from a different angle. Um, take take Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, for example, Matthew 5 through 7. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, it's going to take you about five minutes to read it. But there's no way Jesus preached for just five minutes, right? No, no way. I mean, That's no preaching for five minutes, especially not Jesus. He probably spoke for an hour uh, on that occasion, if it was a single occasion. We don't even know that for sure. So these are not words, the, necessarily the verbatim words of Jesus. This is the authentic message that Jesus communicated. Mm -hmm. The gospel writers are communicating that and they're inspired writers. So they're going to present only what is true, what the Holy Spirit wants them to, 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 to present, 
However, we have to realize it can be summaries. It can be interpretation even of Jesus's words, but it's authentic and inspired and true because the gospel writers themselves are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So some of our problems sometimes maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong then, is um, we will take a kind of a modernist Western read where we want it to line up like a textbook Exactly. This is why we put verses in it that like that what, verses weren't originally in it. So we want it all to be uniform. And this is exactly what he said. And there was a stenographer there and that, yep. that's not it. And it doesn't mean it's not God's word exactly. as a modern Westerner or a postmodern Westerner. We struggle with that, but the rest of the world, as they read it that way is in rest of history, that's not been a problem for them. Right. Don't let anyone say Sean's not a scholar. That, I mean, that's beautiful. That's exactly, that's exactly right. right. We're obsessed in many ways with the apologetic fact features related to the gospels. That we have to defend, this is just what Jesus said, exactly what Jesus said. Not recognizing that, that who Jesus is and the author communicating that is so much more important than whether this event occurred before this event. I mean, we even talk about chronology. I'll, I'll get students who are really upset that maybe the Gospels aren't chronological. And then they'll say, well, at least Luke is chronological. Well, no, Luke isn't necessarily chronological. Luke takes the passage in Luke 4 and brings it forward from a much later place in Mark's Gospel mm -hmm. because he wants to present this sermon as sort of a summary of Jesus's overall message. And then, of course, I, it was a summary because it would take you one minute to read that or to, to present that sermon. In, in church. And there's no way Jesus, you know, gave that synagogue sermon in one minute. So this is Luke communicating, not just the words of Jesus, not just what he said, but the significance of Jesus, who he was. That's so much more important to the gospel writers than mm -hmm. sort of the chronology that this event occurred first, that this event is, ex or that this is precisely what was said on, on this occasion. The significance of what Jesus said and did is of greater, greater importance for the gospel writers. So we need to look for that in particular. Got it. So that's a Western value that we, we want that, but that's not necessarily yeah. what ancient people wanted or cared about or a, right. a lot of cultures. So John, do, do, do you have some questions, man? Yeah, honestly, you guys have just been gobbling up questions as I go. Like I have a question, then you guys, <laughs> and you guys answer it. <laughs> I was dominating but, it. <laughs> and I was blown away by that. Luke, I had never heard that or known that. I've always heard that cast as like his vision casting before he gets started moment. Uh, so that's very, very good. Um, yeah, I, I think you've answered this in a lot of different ways, but I'll, I'll ask it one more different way. Um, what would you say, like, because we talked about the Greek, the Aramaic, the English Bible, the words of Jesus, what would you say is the inspired word of God? Because let's say I have um, a friend in, um, in Islam, and it's, you know, he, he says, hey, the inspired word of God is the Quran in the original language. The minute it leaves that, it's no longer it's no longer the inspired word of God. It's valuable. It's good to read. It can change my life, but it's no longer the inspired word of God. So what would you say is kind of the inspired word of God? Yeah, yeah, totally different view of inspiration than Islam. In Islam, the Arabic is all, is all you get. Everything else is commentary. And you might find Christian scholars who disagree on this, but I would strongly argue that it's the message of the text. It's the meaning of the text that is authoritative and inspired. And so when you translate a text into English, if that faithfully represents the meaning, then that is the inspired wor word of God. I mean, those who say only in the original autographs, only in Greek and Hebrew, well, you tell me what this great Greek phrase means, and you're gonna say something slightly different than I say. Open the commentaries, you'll see. So, you know, it, it's like some people think that if we get back to the Greek and Hebrew, then suddenly we, ha we have the precise meaning, no questions to ask because we know Greek and Hebrew. Many students want to take Greek and Hebrew so they know what the text actually means. But learning Greek and Hebrew doesn't tell you what it means. It just tells you what the real questions are, right? And then you have to answer those questions. So you, you still have to do interpretation. You still have to do exegesis. So, so yeah, so I, I would strongly stress that, that the message of the text is, is what is authoritative, what is inspired, and that message can be translated in other languages. I mean, it's like the incarnation. Think about it. The living word of God came to us in human form, right? The written word of God comes to us fully human, but also fully divine in the same way. It's, it's, it's in language, human language, which itself is imprecise, inexact. It's translated into another language, which, is, which, which it is never exact or absolutely precise. 
But as I probably said a thousand times, and Sean probably heard it before, you can know something truly without knowing it absolutely. Mm. Nothing on this side of eternity are we going to know absolutely with absolute precision. If we're trying to parse what we mean in this conversation, we're communicating well. I think we're understanding probably 90% of what the other person is saying, but not 100%. But we can know truly we are, without knowing absolutely. And we sometimes get obsessed with absolutes. And that's what Islam is, you know, since they realize as, as soon as you move into another language, you're interpreting. Therefore, we're going to keep it into Arabic. Um, but in fact, that Arabic could be interpreted this way or this way or this way. So that you're not escaping that question simply by saying only one language is inspired. It's like those who say only the King James mm -hmm. is the true text. Well, even if you say that, people are going to interpret the King James Version differently. So, so you, you still can't get to that. People are desperate for absolute truth. But on this side of eternity, we're not going to have access to absolute truth. That's why we need the Holy Spirit, right? That's why we need that God to guide, guide us. Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 13, we know in part, right? We know in part. Then we will fully know when we see Christ face to face. So that, that attempt for absolutes, again, getting back to kind of a, what, what Sean was saying, a, a modernistic perspective on truth is going to mis, you know, misdirect us in, in that regard in terms of what we're looking for in scripture. Uh, yeah. That is gold right yep. there. Yep. Uh, you, did, sure. you, you, you heard a, a New Testament scholar talk about how um, truth is truth, but it's like it's not always something that we have full, full grasp of. Um, absolutely but we can know that god is true that jesus is true that the message of the gospel is true and that's really what the the bible is trying to tell us ultimately from genesis to revelation is the message of the gospel the that it's all pointing to the life death resurrection and return of jesus christ amen um so i have a question and this may or may not make it in in um it's more i'm more curious um, and this is more of a whole Bible question than a New, New Testament question, um, but it's, it's been a, a philosophy I, I've kind of held to in my preaching, and I wanted to, and if I'm wrong, we'll cut this out. Don't worry, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, uh, I'm a, a proponent of, uh, I, I, I'm a big I'm an evangelist, right? So um, one of the things that I've always kind of really strive for is that in the in the scriptures, and I heard um, a story about Spurgeon saying this, and I thought this was a, a, an interesting story, and I just wanted your take on it, is um, he preached, I think Tim Keller tells a story actually, but I guess he preached when he was like 17 or 18 at some church in Wales. He uh, preached out of Leviticus somewhere in the Old Testament. Uh, people loved it. When he was done, the old Welsh pastor, he asked him, he said, hey, how, how was that? And the old pastor said that was terrible. <laughs> and, you know, Spurgeon's the prince of preachers. And, you know, even at 17, he knew he was good. And he said, what are you, what are you talking about? And the Welsh pastor said, well, you didn't preach Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, Spurgeon argued, well, I preached the text that you gave me. And then he said, young man, what, what is the capital of this island we're on? He said, London. And he said, every road somehow through detours begins and ends in London. And you can get to London through every road. He goes, son, who is the capital of the scripture? Jesus Christ. He goes, you should find a way of the gospel from every text. Um, give me your thoughts on that. Um, I, I don't think I ever heard anything like that come from you, but I just, I feel like that's a something that would resonate maybe i have one word amen i mean that's right. good <laughs> or maybe two words i'll say luke 24 you know because the disciples on the road to emmaus right beginning with moses and all the prophets he, he he taught about himself from moses and all the prophets i mean it all it all leads to the center point of human history which is the coming of jesus the messiah absolutely and all of history since looks back on that event, that event as the center point and then forward to the consummation of the kingdom. Everything before that points forward to the coming of, of Christ. So absolutely, every every passage in the Bible. Um, yeah, it, it can teach, it can edify, it can do all kinds of things, but ultimately it should lead to Jesus. Yeah, somehow, yeah. Because that's my, my colleague, um, my colleague on the NIV committee and, and uh, retired professor from Calvin, Michael Williams has a book called How to Read the Bible Through the Jesus Lens. Ooh. 
And it's that very, that very issue. Yeah. Wow. I'll be, I'll be picking that up. So Mark, <laughs> um, what, what are some books you've read recently that you've really been blessed by? Oh my goodness. Um, in my field, I've been, blessed is, is, is an interesting question because am I blessed by it or as I, am I informed by it? I'm, I'm reading a lot. I'm writing a book on the, a critical introduction to the gospel of Mark. I've written a couple of commentaries on Mark's gospel and a critical introduction. And so I've been reading a lot on the audience of the gospel. And um, Richard Baucom came out with a perspective about Oh, two decades ago now, where he argued that the Gospels were not written to individual communities, they were written rather to the church as a whole, and provide some pretty solid evidence for that. Um, and I haven't changed my view, I think he's only partly right, but that's been really, really mm. informative and helpful for me. Just about everything Richard Baucom does uh, is that way, uh, so, sort of like um, N.T. Wright, um, mm. you know, just about everything he writes has, is going to intrigue you and, and get you thinking as well. So um, in, in terms of sort of the academic side, that's a, that's a book I've just, uh, the, uh, re reading Balcom's work in that area has, has been really helpful. Um, in terms of devotional, I haven't been in much these in recent days in, in terms of devotional books. Um, some of the, um, Esau Macaulay just came out with a book called Reading While Black. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm just getting into that. Um, I, I think the whole, you know, questions of of last year, especially in the Black Lives Matter movement um, and the election and so forth, and where we are politically, I'm kind of a, a, a news junkie, and so that whole area um, of of sort of where the church is and what evangelicalism is all about is a huge interest to me. I'm actually writing a little bit in that area, but Macaulay's book is a good one. And there's a lot being written in that area as well. Sort of, you know, what, um, how do we read the scripture and hear the voice of, of others? Mm. In it? That's excellent. I, I got, I got a devotional to recommend for you. Yeah. Uh, Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. Okay. I, I've read it four times in 2020. It was so excellent. good. Really Gentle good. and Lowly. Um, yeah. And you probably know Ray Ortland. And, uh -huh. and the grand and his grandfather um but dane is this one of his sons and okay just put it out this year it's really great good. thank you very much I'll John, take a do you have any, any other questions for him yeah I have a few more um so we we're talking about the four portraits of jesus presented in the gospels and um as history and philosophy tries to tear down and minimize the who jesus is a lot of times an argument that i've heard over the years is that jesus was not unique uh, in antiquity, that his story was not unique, that there were many other dying and resurrecting uh, Messiah figures. Uh, there were many other virgin births. There were many, pretty much everything he did was replicated in antiquity. Um, and I think that that, that question kind of was uh, sparked in the mainstream back in the Da Vinci Code days. That's kind of faded away. But I think uh, a lot of times in millennial circles that are still interested in um, antiquity and, and, and kind of issues like this, it still arises. People will still talk to their friends who are atheists and they'll say, oh, Christ was not unique. Um, so how, how would you respond to that? Is, is he unique in antiquity, the story of a, a dying and rising Messiah and so on? Yeah. Yeah. It, it actually goes far, far, much farther back than the Da Vinci Code. The, 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 what's in Germany, the movement, the history of religions movement, which tried to find sort of antecedents to Christianity in, in Babylonian religions and the mystery religions and a variety of others. And, you know, it, it, for the most part, have utterly failed. And you take any component that they, that they try to compare to Jesus, and it really is very, very different. Um, you know, some people say, oh, everybody was a miracle worker in the ancient world. Well, show me, show me. Is it, you know, it's true that Caesar Augustus was purported to have, you know, healed a blind man or, or um, but, but Dionysius of Tyana is one of the closest parallels and, and they keep going back to Dionysius. But if you look at him, he's, first of all, he's long after the time of Jesus. Um, and his biographer isn't till a hundred years after his time. And so long after the time of Jesus. And so Really, it could be Jesus, the Jesus tradition affecting those stories rather than vice, vice versa. You look at rabbis and you've got a couple of rabbis who, who were rainmakers or something like, something like that, you know, who actually perform miracles. But, 
but very different than Jesus's miracles. They, they prayed and, and rain came. They, you know, they, they were incredible, powerful in terms of prayers. But Jesus's miracles connected to the coming of the kingdom of God, absolutely unique. Uh, you, you see nothing like that in, in anywhere else um, in, in the ancient world. Um, in terms of virgin births, in terms of, or dying and rising, we'll start with that, dying and rising again, gods, these are fertility cycle gods that basically die and rise every year as the earth replenishes in the spring, dies in the winter, it has nothing to do with the rising of the dead fine judgment just part john are you losing him do we're actually losing you a little bit mark i don't know if you have a way to improve your reception you're kind of getting crackly on us is he there now john uh oh i've lost you too i'm back mark is still there we may have lost you. I think we lost him. That's okay. We have a good, a good amount a here. Yeah. No, it's all good. Mark, you Not there? sure what happened. Oh, good. good, good. Did I, I cut out at what point? Do you know? Or? You, were, you were talking about how the dying and rising saviors were actually uh, fertility cycles. Right. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you want me to, to review that, start talk, talking all in, any more about that. I switched. Um, I don't know. If, did I just cut out or was it getting bad? It was getting bad. It got bad and then yeah. it cut out. <laughs> so okay i went to i just went to my 5g and normally that'll stabilize things i don't know why it cuts to something else i think sometimes uh, it loses that 5g that, that's okay uh you've been giving us gold we have like yeah. more than we need to work well with. tell me yeah tell, and tell me whatever you want me to if if you want me to review or just move on from there that's fine just gonna keep moving on that from there okay in terms of do you want me to repeat that at all the the dying and rising again are you okay with that we lost you, John. You're muted. Sorry. You're Sorry. Muted. Go and do that part again, but just kind of in a brief manner. Okay, sure. You bet. Yeah. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus is very different than the, the dying and rising deities of the fertility cults and so forth. Those are linked to the cycles of nature. You know, every winter nature dies and then spring it comes back. And so it's cyclical. Jesus' resurrection is clearly linked uh, to Daniel chapter 12, to the Jewish perception perspective that at the end of time the dead will be raised to be judged and and the final resurrection and jesus is the beginning of the final resurrection in judaism nothing like this annual cycle of dying and rising again mm -hmm. so most of these parallels are extremely superficial they, they don't connect to what jesus actually said and did when you leak jesus's miracles to his jewish background and to the hebrew scriptures you see that the miracles are related to the restoration of creation mm -hmm promised in Isaiah and the prophets. And you just don't find that anywhere else. So I'm, I, I think most of this talk of, of parallels or, um, is, is really inaccurate. Well, and don't, don't you think, Mark, um, you know, I read the works of C.S. Lewis and right, he had his PhD in, in ancient literature, like myths. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the, the gospels aren't written, as he says, they're not written like other myths are, where these sure. other things like Mithras and these other um, pagan, these stories, those are written in a myth mythological style of literature as compared to say the gospel narratives are. So yeah, absolutely. That, you know, the yeah. gospel narrative is, is more an eyewitness than a um, mythological type of literature. Right, and the closest literary parallels to the gospels are the Greco-Roman bioi or biographies. Um, and that's pretty much the consensus of scholarship today. Um, and those biographies were, were written to extol the virtues of famous people. They're not, they're not mythological um, treatments for the, for the most part. And so I, I, the gospels are different from the biographies as well. They, they, none of the biographies identify the person they're writing about as the center point of human history as God's representative to bring salvation to the, to the world. But at the same time, in terms of Jesus being a historical person, and the events of the Gospels being represented as historical incidents, I think it's pretty obvious that that's what the Gospel writers are doing. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then maybe one more. I, I know this is a big one, Mark, but I, and, and feel free to uh, uh, really be brief on it because we, we spent some time in a class on hermeneutics uh, at our uh, school, uh, school of uh, theology here. And uh, we used a couple of your videos. And um, you mentioned the word interpretation uh, earlier. And the last step in um, living out God's word is our, inter our process. And the, the Bible has obviously been used to do a lot of different things um, over the years, which some are right, some are wrong. So as, as a reader of the Bible, um, how would you recommend somebody go about um, reading to interpret and then to live out um, God's word um, faithfully? Right, right. Um, yeah, I wrote a book called How to Read the Bible in Changing Times, which is hmm. sort of a hermeneutics, an introductory hermeneutics text. And hermeneutics, we really talk about two steps of, of biblical interpretation. Um, some people talk about three. We talk about observation, interpretation, application. The problem with that is observation and interpretation are always go hand in hand. You can't observe anything without interpreting. But, but really, if you put those two together, you have exegesis, which is determining what the author intended. So entering into the world of the text. That's our first and primary goal when we're reading scripture. So we look at the historical setting, the historical context. We look at the literary context, the flow of thought. We look at the genre, the literary form. Mm -hmm. And our goal is always to, to hear the message as the original author intended it to be heard. Mm -hmm. So we're moving, we're crossing the bridge back. We sometimes use this bridge analogy. We're crossing the bridge back from our world to the world of the first century, if we're talking about the New Testament. Um, but that's only half the task. Once we can hear the word, the message in the way it was meant to be heard in that context, we still have to say, but how is God speaking to us today? And we call that application or more in a more sophisticated form, we call it contextualization, taking the message given to them and recontextualizing it into our cultural context so that we hear the voice, the voice of God today telling us what to do. And we all do this naturally in the sense that, you know, we, we read a passage and we, we say, okay, what principles do I learn from that passage and how do I apply it to my, my life today? But that's, you know, what it means to live out scripture is to hear the voice of God. Um, I argue for something I call a heart of God hermeneutic, where we listen for God's purpose, ultimately his, his intention behind the message. So when, when, you know, the apostle Paul says, um, you know, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. What, what's the message there for us? Um, what is the, you know, the, the principle behind that, that, that teaches us and guides us um, how, to, how to live today in passages that, you know, that don't seem to have direct application. Paul says for women to cover their head in worship. What's the heart of God behind that passage? for example. Well, we have to do both exegesis and contextualization. You first have to determine what did head covering signify in that first century context? And then what's the principle behind that that applies today? What is the heart of God? What was Paul's intention? What was God's intention behind that, that command in that cultural context? How do we replicate that purpose and goal in our cultural context? And you know, there's principles we can apply. Does, is it consistent throughout scripture? There's a principle principle of purpose that we just mentioned. What, what is the original author's purpose? How do we replicate that purpose? Um, those are the kinds of questions that I think we need to ask of the text and answer, but really crossing the bridge back to the original context, bringing the message, hearing God speak to us today, um, contextualizing the message for today. Yeah, Sean, I think I've heard you say that the Bible was not written to us, but it was written for us, if that's, if that's you, yep. I think. I stole that from Fee and Stewart, and I think probably, I probably stole it from, from both Mark. of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's that's really a great mm -hmm. statement it, mm -hmm. because it, it does it it gives it recognize the reality of that bridge, right? It's not written to us, but it's written for us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Amen. Yeah, I preached on that head covering uh, passage last mm -hmm. year. You did. Oh well. Uh, yeah, we very went good. through Corinthians, you know, and that. Oh my goodness. And I think I did it well because that's what I went for. I went for what is what did that mean in that cultural context, and then what does that mean in our cultural context? Excellent. Um, so now all the women in our church wear head coverings. And yeah, don't yeah. Talk. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs>
And maybe they should, you know, too often we make these decisions based on what we want culturally. Well, mm-hmm. no, we don't need to do our hair covering today because our women would never do it. You know, it's like, it's, mm-hmm. well, that's not the right reason. The right reason. Is- yeah. Yeah. So very, very uh, cool. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much for being on with us, man. This has been fascinating. It's been fun for me too. Thanks for inviting me. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Awesome.